Good evening. Thank you for joining us on NTV Tonight. Ahead. Tonight, 210 billion shillings. Loan repayment or development needs. Government goes ahead to issue another euro bond. People can now drive from cities to their rural homes uh, and that needs funding. Plus, more arrests at Times Towers. Others seek freedom in court. KRA staff linked to tax evasion scheme not evading custody time yet. And the flamboyant Jared Kiasa Otieno arrested as the fake gold probe continues. Just how did he grow his wealth overnight? Villas are going for 105 million. Yeah, and the five bedroom villas. Also tonight, international animal rights activists now want government to ban the slaughter of donkeys in Kenya. NTV Tonight with Mark Masai and Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks very much for joining us. Tonight, our sign language interpreter is Rafael Mbalo. To our top story, and Kenya has been forced to borrow from the international market yet again to avoid defaulting on its maturing loans. This amid growing concerns over the sustainability of the country's public debt levels. A significant chunk of the newly issued 210 billion shilling euro bond will go to servicing existing loans as the government juggles between infrastructure development needs and easing the debt repayment pressure. Victor Kiprop starts us off tonight. With only two weeks to the maturity of the 75 billion shillings euro bond floated in 2014, Kenya has issued a fresh 210 billion shillings euro bond in order to refinance the debut euro bond and finance infrastructure projects. The announcement of Kenya issuance, I must say, really triggered an over overwhelming response from investors all over the world. Uh, as you all know, the, our bond was oversubscribed four and a half times, uh, so uh, that is a clear indication of uh, investors having confidence in our economy. A bond is a type of debt instrument in which an investor is promised to be repaid their debt at a future date and at a particular interest rate. This type of financing does not necessarily require a security and that is why only governments with good credit record and low risk of default succeed to raise money by this method. The money raised through the euro bonds forms part of the foreign debt stock for a country. The issuance is Kenya's third euro bond in five years after the first and second euro bonds floated in 2014 and 2018 raised a total of 475 billion shillings. Some of the borrowing that like we have done today goes into filling the gap so that we can continue to invest on those critical areas where Mwananchi really uh, needs uh, the support. People can now drive from cities to their rural homes uh, and that needs funding both from our revenues that we collect and also the borrowing. But with part of the 2014 eurobond falling due amid a slowdown in revenue growth, analysts had raised concerns over Kenya's capacity to repay its debts, warning that a default would soil Kenya's ability to tap into the international debt market. Between January and March this year, the National Treasury took a fresh 125 billion shillings worth of medium-term syndicated loans to retire maturing short-term foreign loans, including a 78.7 .7 billion shillings syndicated loan it procured in 2017. According to data by the National Treasury, Kenya spent about 538 billion shillings servicing debt between July last year and March this year, a figure that the 2019-2020 budget statement estimates that could cross the 1 trillion shillings mark in the next financial year. The growing budget deficit has left the Kenyan government with fewer options to finance its ballooning expenditure, and this has made borrowing one of the easiest ways to raise and plug the hole. These new options include the Islamic 
economic financing instruments, green bonds, samurai and panda bonds and diaspora bonds over the medium term. In seeking the new financing options, Treasury opts to diversify the sources of external debt and reduce over-reliance on current sources of debt financing. Kenya has been increasingly turning to China for debts to fund infrastructure projects, and this has seen China upstage Western countries to become Kenya's biggest lender. Victor Kiprop, NTV. A senior Kenya Revenue Authority official identified as Job Omole was this evening arrested by detectives from the Directorate of Criminal Investigations. The operation that was conducted on the fourth floor of the KRA offices at Times Towers caused panic among employees. Another employee identified as Brenda Ondieki was also reportedly arrested earlier today while attempting to flee the country. So far, 67 KRA employees have been arrested and the DCI is looking for an additional 30. In the meantime, 18 employees presented in court today will spend 10 more days in custody to allow for investigations. Setulale also reports that three others who did not surrender to the DCI and who failed to secure anticipatory bail were arrested today at the Milimani Law Courts. In his ruling, Senior Resident Magistrate Paul Mayova observed that some 30 other staff from KRA implicated in the graft case have gone into hiding, saying if the suspects already in court are released, they are likely to interfere with ongoing investigations, including contacting or influencing potential witnesses. The 18 suspects who were arrested on Tuesday after surrendering themselves to the Directorate of Criminal Investigations officers along Campbell Road were detained for 10 more days. The Director of Public Prosecutions wanted them detained for 21 days to enable investigators to retrieve crucial information that can be used during trial from interrogation and the confiscated electronic gadgets. And there is danger of the respondents <coughs> interfering with the investigation in case they are released. The defense team, however, argues that the suspects have already cooperated with authorities by surrendering to the DCI. It is, cannot be because of the argument of time and the huge numbers of uh, the people who have been arrested or brought before you. We trump on the rights of justice. Senior Resident Magistrate Paul Mayova directed that the matter be mentioned on May 27th. On the same day, another set of 38 suspects who are remanded for 14 days are set to appear in court. In the meantime, the magistrate disqualified himself from presiding over the case of four other suspects who were arraigned after surrendering to the DCI yesterday. The four alongside three others, had earlier been denied anticipatory bail and ordered to surrender for arrest and prosecution. The three KRA suspects who were arrested at the Mill Money Locals after failing to surrender themselves at the DCI headquarters will be arraigned in court on Friday together with four other KRA officials from Mombasa. Seth Olale, NTV at the Mill Money Locals, Nairobi. Well, more than 60 Kenya Revenue Authority staff could likely lose their jobs following their arrests and detention as they are subject to the KRA Code of Conduct, which provides for punishment of employees arrested for an offence punishable by imprisonment and not released within 14 days. But even as they fight for survival, Commissioner General John Jiraini has been handed what you might consider a lifeline by the board, which recalled him to steer the ship. In these perilous times, Ken Mijungu breaks down why the KRA employees' troubles may just be beginning. The arrest and arraignment of these employees of the Kenya Revenue Authority in court could spell the end of their employment, either by the virtue of being charged with criminal offences or because they have contravened the code of conduct which they signed to uphold. They are accused of aiding and abetting tax evasion and bribery in the course of their duties. 
The code of conduct stipulates that staff shall not trade or engage in any business that may lead to a conflict of interest with the authority. Such businesses include, but are not limited to, customs clearance agency, container freight stations, accounting or auditing, or tax consulting firms. Further, the staff are prohibited from engaging in fraud, bribery, embezzlement, or misappropriation of public funds, abuse of office, deception, conflict of interest, bid rig and breach of trust. This is why the fate of those arrested and even those who voluntarily appeared at the Directorate of Criminal Investigations hangs in the balance. According to the Code of Conduct, the disciplinary action may include caution, warning, termination or even dismissal from employment depending on the nature of the offence. The authority may then suspend or terminate the services of an officer facing criminal proceedings of a serious nature instituted against them or if convicted by a court of law of a serious criminal offence. In the meantime, and in a steely fight to survive, the board handed drowning outgoing Commissioner General John Njeraini as straw to clutch at. Njeraini was set to leave at the end of last week when the crisis occurred. A close door meeting held by top management and the board resolved to recall him to see them through the storm. Njeraini has served for seven years instead of the constitutional six after he got an extension. Ken Mijungu, NT. Suspected fake gold conman Jared Kiasa Otieno is the latest in the list of those arrested in the shady gold export business deals. Well, police towed away luxurious vehicles and carted away documents in boxes and also computers. But it's not his first shave with the law. That's right, and he is facing a number of accusations in court by a number of foreign nationals who accused him of conning them of huge sums of money. Charity Mwangi tries to unveil the man beneath the extravagance and the questions about the source of his immense wealth. Suspected fraudster Jared Kiaso Tieno was the latest to have been arrested in connection with the fake gold syndicate. But it is not his first brush with the law in so far as the fake gold schemes go. In June 2017, he was arrested and is battling a court case where he is accused of swindling a Brazilian national 23 million shillings in a gold export scheme. The court heard that he pretended to be in a position to ship for him 8 kilograms of gold to Dubai. The outcome of the case is still unknown. DCI George Kinoti confirmed his arrest, terming him and other suspects in the fake gold scam as harmful to the economy since they are selling what does not exist. On social media, Jared is the picture of sophistication. It is in where he lives, what he wears, what he drinks, and what he drives or occasionally flies. The suspect, Jared Otieno, is said to be the owner of the house right behind me, house number five. This is where police officers came looking for him. However, according to those we spoke to, this is not his official residence. He, however, visits the property over the weekend and especially when entertaining his friends. His official residence is in Kileleishwa. The house is extensive and each unit has a pool and luxurious finishes. The project nestled in Nairobi's current suburbs is under Saiton Investments. It will take great financial muscle for anyone who will desire to own this piece of heaven. The villas are going for 105 million. Yeah, and the five bedroom villas stand alone. The payment plans that we have currently, we have a cash plan. The police impounded his vehicles during the raid of the premises, a Porsche and a Bentley that stand out like a sore thumb on Kenyan streets. If that is not enough, the interiors are customized, bearing his name as a stamp of ownership. His exuberance has often set tongues wagging. He caused quite a stir when he exchanged nuptials with his wife when he arrived at the venue in a helicopter. Oteno grew up in Diwa, Homa Bay County. He joined Orero High School in 2005. Those who know him claim that he was humble and quiet while in school. There have been questions about the source of his wealth that he every so often flaunts despite his young age. Fifteen suspects were arrested in a house in Kileleishwa, Nairobi on Monday this week on suspicion of being involved in the illegal fake gold trade. The DCI says investigations are ongoing with more arrests in the pipeline. 
the controversy over the fake gold syndicate has drawn in politicians and other influential persons, among them Bungoma Senator Moses Wetangula and politician Zahir Jihanda. Charity Mwangi, NTV. All right, some interesting developments there and certainly a story that we will continue to follow. To another key story, well, shame is what someone feels upon the sickening realisation that one's actions were regrettable. But it's an emotion members of Parliament have proven themselves devoid of time and again when it comes to advancing their interests on Wanjiku's tab. The sense of entitlement the MPs have proved with their latest demands has seemingly inoculated them and left them insensitive to the real-life consequences of an inflated wage bill that you are breaking your back to sustain and that has left you deprived of the development you've paid for through the nose, as NTV's Olive Burroughs highlights in this report. And remember yesterday, the SRC had a press conference and demanded that members of parliament, this is including members of the National Assembly and the Senate, must refund what they were given with regards to the housing allowance. And Moshimiwa, are you going to refund this money as the SRC is requiring of you? <laughs> the very idea is laughable. That while the vast majority of the nation can hardly scrape together enough to qualify for a mortgage, let alone keep the landlord from slapping a padlock on their room doors, MPs qualify not only for a 20 million shilling mortgage, but also a quarter of a million shillings in a housing allowance, all 416 of them. Oh wait, sorry, my miscalculation. If the Salaries and Remuneration Commission is to be believed, that would be a 20 million shilling mortgage, a 250,000 shilling housing allowance, and the housing allowance already factored into their salaries of 621,250. And that's not even factoring in the thousands they receive monthly in a transport allowance, their 10 million shilling inpatient insurance cover, or the 7 million shilling car loan they qualify for. For. No, for this crop of legislators, it's simply not enough. There is a mission to demean members of parliament and reduce them to beggars. That's right, they deserve to have the car grants they previously enjoyed reinstated so that they're properly elevated when they drive down the potholed roads to their constituencies. <laughs> Looking down their tinted windows are the constituents who receive no special parliamentary allowance as they break their backs to ensure the local MP is kept only in the most lavish of lifestyles. After all, they've made it abundantly clear they did not campaign so hard to be mere public servants. I worked. I fought it out to be a member of parliament. I campaigned. I used my resources. I want to be paid well. As I said, they made it abundantly clear right from the onset whose interests they would be advancing once they got into office. I am greatly disturbed by some of the remarks we have been hearing from yesterday of individuals who wish to claim that they should be paid more and they will demand more than what the law provides them. even before they have been sworn in. <laughs> even before they have been sworn in. I am saying before you, I swear I shall not sign that law. Well, Mr. President, looks like they got the better of you. It's their time to eat. After all, what does it matter that Kenya is borrowing 210 billion shillings in a new euro bond to repay the first? That Kenya has to borrow to finance her development needs because the bulk of her taxes go into paying salaries. What's important is that if deputy governors get a house, so should MPs. These CSs are provided with all manner of um, facilitation, mod GK vehicles. That does not happen to a member of parliament. And therefore we say no, we will go ahead and pay our members what we had already budgeted for. After all, who's going to stop them? You? Olive Barrows, NTV. 
The supremacy battle between the Senate and the National Assembly is about to take a new twist, with the Senate now tasking its legal committee with uh, critically reviewing bills passed without their input since 2013 when the Senate came into effect. The move now opens a new battlefront between the two houses, which are currently locked in a tussle over how much money should go to the counties. NTV's political affairs reporter Kennedy Moredi gives us the latest on this ensuing battle. The Senate is escalating the feud between them and the National Assembly, with the Senate's leadership now tasking the Justice Committee with reviewing all the bills that have been passed by the National Assembly and assented to by the President without the involvement of the Senate, with the intent of moving to the High Court to have them annulled. We have tasked the Directorate of Legal uh, Services of the Senate and also my committee will be able to give the country the exact number because we are doing auditing from 2013 to now to see the laws that have been passed without the consent of the Senate and it touches on the counties. 60 days. According to the Senate leadership, their silence has given the leadership of the National Assembly an opportunity to run amok and it was time they stamped their authority. The new battle has been triggered by the non-inclusion of the Senate in debating and passage of the health bill and the tussle over the amount of money that should be forwarded to counties. There is an, an, an attitude that has been developed by the enemies of devolution. You have seen they have tried to cut down from $335 billion that was suggested by the Senate and the uh, CRA. They have also tried to bring clawback clauses to try and claw back the devolution. And if we allow, we sit ground as the Senate, then it means there will be so many clawback clauses that will affect and, and eventually they will kill devolution. If I was to apportion blame, I would blame the speakers of the two uh, uh, houses of parliament because the business of the House Assembly, uh, of the National Assembly, to, is to pass their bill. The Speaker of the National Assembly uh, knows, just like the Speaker of uh, the uh, Senate, that, for example, the matter in question, or the matter in context, the error of the bills, is a bill, is, is, is a bill that touches on counties. We'll have a Kamgunji with the entire Senate on how to proceed to the next step so that we don't, you know, Senate has a very critical role and it is very important when you look at Article 110 of the Constitution, when you look even before the President ascends, it's provided under the Constitution, it is the bill of the, before Kazetman, it is the Parliament and Parliament has been defined to mean the National Assembly and the Senate. The issues between the houses have also been compounded by the constant feuding between the majority leaders of both houses of parliament who seem not to see eye to eye most of the time with each kin to protect their tough. Kennedy Muredi and TV. The government has deployed the dreaded General Service Unit or the GSU to Matungu constituency in Kakamega County to hunt down the gangs behind the campaign of violence there. Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi, who toured the trouble re troubled region, also said a key suspect believed to be coordinating the killings from Kawangware right here in Nairobi has also been arrested. Zakis Mwasame reports. Trapped in a grim limbo, residents of Matungu in Kakamega have for a long time lived at the mercy of the brutal and swift gangs that have terrorized them for days. Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi visited the troubled killing fields in response to the campaign of violence that has seen dozen killed and many more maimed. The government will now deploy more boots to the ground to quell the wave of violence there. Nataka ni muombe kwa sababu hawa majangili ambao wanaleta shida hapa nyinyi mnaishi nao. Nataka nyinyi mnawajua. Nataka kama mnawajua mpashe mpashe habari. Matiangi says a key suspect believed to be coordinating the killings has been arrested. He said to be from Kawangware in Nairobi. He at the same time warned politicians in the area believed to be fanning the flames of violence. <laughs> Residents have been demanding an overhaul of the sub county security apparatus, accusing them of failing to respond to their attacks on time. <laughs> Wako 
kwa kusumbua wananchi. Mimi najiuliza hivi tafadhali. Wewe kweli ni kiongozi wa aina gani unataka umwaikaji wa adamu ili uonyeshe nguvu zako za kisiasa? The gang is usually armed with machetes and metal bars. They have been raiding homes at night, viciously attacking their victims before disappearing into the night. More than 25 people have lost their lives in Matungo in a period of two months. The most recent case is that of a family from Sayango village where a pregnant mother and her three-year-old daughter were butchered. Their husband was left with serious machete injuries. <laughs> A security operation is currently ongoing in the region with the intention of rooting out the gang members. For Dr. Matiangi, his visit to Matungu is the beginning of a peaceful coexistence that the residents have lacked for some time. He has equally warned the perpetrators that their days are numbered. Zakis Masame, NTV, Kakamega. From Matungu, NTV tonight takes a quick break. It's 22 minutes past the hour. We'll be back shortly.
Thanks for staying with us. The Kenya National Union of Teachers Secretary General Wilson Sosion has directed all teachers to continue using the old curriculum, saying the new competence-based curriculum, whose national policy was launched yesterday, falls short of expectation and did not involve all stakeholders. Sosion accused Education Cabinet Secretary George Magoha of being arrogant and dismissive. NTV's education reporter Sharon Baranga with that story. If you want war with us, we are prepared to go the full length if you are ready. The top leadership of the Kenya National Union of Teachers stands by its decision to not support the rollout of the competence-based curriculum. The union leaders had stayed away from yesterday's launch of the national policy. Because we spent too much time thinking about nothing, talking about nothing. If we get it wrong, we shall damage millions and millions of children for many years to come. And no reform or review anywhere in the world can succeed if teachers are not on board. NAT says the country is not ready for the competence-based curriculum, saying the infrastructure in schools is wanting. The current trainers of the CBC lacked skills and competencies, and the government had failed to agree on the assessment procedure. At least three teachers are required per class, and the sector has a shortage of tutors. The union also says business people keen to profit from the process are behind the push to implement the CBC. There is no more professionalism in CBC. There is 100% and above politics in CBC. The union leaders took issue with what they claim was Magoha's dismissive tone. Mwalimu amefundishwa miaka miwili kufundisha mtaala ule wa awali. Leo hii wampeleka mahali siku moja ama siku mbili. Wasema ameiva sasa anaweza kufundisha mtaala huu mpya. Tupeleka wapi nchi? Mwambie ni magoa tafadhali. Mwambie ni magoa tafadhali. Kama vile walipasua wal, watu wazima kule vichwa, asipasue watoto wetu. The government insists the rollout of the CBC is on. Even as the Kenya National Union of Teachers and the Ministry of Education continue to flex their muscles, pupils and their parents are going to bear the brunt of the protracted battle for supremacy. Sharon Baranga, NTV. To the corridors of justice now, the High Court has ruled in favor of the prosecution after it allowed use of the confession made by one of the suspects in the murder of lawyer Willie Kimani and two others. The hearing will proceed on the 8th of July. The four police officers accused of killing human rights lawyer Willie Kimani, his client and a taxi driver today appeared before Justice Jesse Lesit. The High Court has allowed the prosecution to use the confession of one of the suspects in the Willie Kimani murder case. The confession, narrating how the chilling murders were carried out, was made by Peter Ngugi, a police informer who has been charged together with the four administration police officers. Justice Jesse Lesit ruled that the confession is admissible in court and was recorded within the law and can be used as evidence. The court has also declined to release the four officers on bond. The police officers had argued that the case had taken long to conclude and they should be granted bail. However, Justice Lesit said that it was the accused who had delayed the case by having so many adjournments. The hearing will proceed on July 8, 2019. And now to justice for donkeys. Animal rights activists, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, or PETA, now want the Kenyan government to ban the slaughter of donkeys for skins exported to China to make medicine of the extreme cruelty that they experience in government-sanctioned slaughterhouses. Now, the activists say that while the slaughterhouses are cashing in on the Chinese appetite for hide, these gentle beasts are subjected to hideous conditions. A video released by animal rights activist people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA, pulls back the curtain on the cruelty meted out on donkeys in the slaughterhouses of Mogotio and Naivasha. In Naivasha, workers were caught on film violently beating frightened donkeys were crammed so tightly together that they could barely move. 
The activists want Kenya to ban the slaughter of donkeys for Chinese medicine, a practice which has soared in recent years. Donkey skins are exported to China to make a traditional medicine known as a jiao, which is believed to improve blood circulation. It was once the preserve of emperors but is now highly sought after by a growing middle class. Several African countries have banned the export of donkey skins and closed Chinese-owned slaughterhouses, meaning thousands are now tracked long distances into Kenya from countries like Ethiopia, Uganda and Somalia, a distance that can take up to two days, during which the donkeys are given nothing to eat. In the same video, two donkeys who had died during the long trip are seen being dragged and another unable to stand dumped on the ground. John Karaoke, the manager of a slaughterhouse where the alleged abuse was observed, denied any claims of abuse. The AGL industry produces 5,000 tons of products, half of which are imported to China. In the last three years, Kenya has opened three new donkey slaughterhouses in order to cater for this trade. In Tanzania, there had been cases of slaughterhouse workers using sledgehammers to kill donkeys. In Botswana, there have been cases where donkeys have been rounded up and machine gunned. In South Africa, slaughter operators have admitted using hammers to kill the donkeys or skinning them alive. In April 2018, the Ministry of Agriculture said that they will not license new donkey slaughterhouses over fears that the beast of burden might become extinct in the country. The government is yet to respond to the matter. Helen Wanjohi, NTV. Many probably didn't know that was happening here. Perhaps a tag we should have used is Punda Amechoka. And we're about to take a break, but before that, something you should look forward to in the next few days. Two miners have been the subjects of vicious battles in and out of the court in the scramble for custody. But now the state has taken them from the guardians and adoptive parents and reintegrated them. The big question, how did the minors end up in the alternative family care and why has the state taken them back? Well, our investigative reporter Edmund Nyabola embarks on a journey to unravel the mystery behind this saga. Here's a sneak preview of this Sunday's NTV's Investigates Caught to Court. A rescue operation by the DCI Child Protection Unit. You've taken him? Are you kidding me? You did just take him. You, you have literally killed him. This is a sick baby. You know, he's, we are the only parents he's ever known. Walikuwa pale ndani kwa karatasi ya polythene paper. The guardianship process to start without involving Morgan. That's one of the irregularities. We have been denied access into New Life Home Trust. There were two men holding guns. So you can imagine my shock. You knew that the mother wanted her child back. All right, make sure that you catch Caught to Court this weekend with Edmund Nyabola. On that note, it's just gone past half past the hour. Stay with us, Mark. We'll be back with the business news. When the spirit of Kenya got going that magical
Time to talk business now. The decongestion of traffic in the capital city is unlikely to happen anytime soon if authorities in the transport sector maintain their disjointed approach towards the execution of viable solutions. This is what came out of a forum organized by the Institute of Economic Affairs, which focused on economic implications of traffic jams in Nairobi and explored possible solutions. Alex Mwangi was there and found this report. Nairobi's traffic jams are legendary, and so far, measures to address the congestion in the city have had little success. Matters are compounded by the fact that the city is said to be the second fastest growing in Africa after Dar es Salaam, with its population growing by an estimated half a million every year. We are lagging behind Addis Ababa, Da, uh, Johannesburg, and others who have introduced uh, decent uh, public transport and systems that are working. We don't employ professionals to take that position. If you're asked in the county of Nairobi, who are the planners of transport? Maybe, there's none. But if you go to South Africa, you'll find Kenyans involved in the transport planning in South Africa. According to World Bank figures, 50 million shillings worth of productivity is lost daily on account of Nairobi's traffic jams. Besides the lengthy time taken to navigate from point A to B in the city, the perennial traffic congestion also has an impact on the quality of life of residents. I was having a discussion with the Ministry of Health and they were telling us that uh, in the recent past, cases of uh, upper respiratory illnesses are on the increase. And that one is mainly because of the air quality uh, we are having in Nairobi. Some of our visas are very sick due to that carbon dioxide pollution of our road, but we have nothing else to do. We were posted here to work, we must work, and some of us, it's a passion. So we are just working. <laughs> Although it is affecting us, we are working. Transport is the second largest contributor to the country's GDP after agriculture. To address the city's traffic problem, the Ministry of Transport is exploring the introduction of an intelligent traffic management system, besides seeking to introduce a mass rapid transit system over the short term. We can't say this development when uh, the poor are driving. Then we claim that that's development. We say this development when even the middle class and the upper class are actually able to use our public transport. So how can we actually promote that? Alex Mwangi, NTV. All well, residents of parts of Wasingishu County who will be forced to relocate to pave way for the construction of Eldoret Bypass have given the government a one-month ultimatum uh, to fully compensate them for surrendering their land for the very same construction. The residents say if they are not compensated, then they will take action to stop this project. But the national government has moved to calm their fears, saying the residents will be compensated in phases. Lois Wangoy found this report. The construction of the Eldoret Bypass is underway, but the residents living along it are a worried lot. They are yet to receive any coin in compensation for the land they gave up for the construction. The National Land Commission, NLC, had declared amounts to the tune of 4.1 billion shillings as money is to be shared amongst those whose land will be taken over for the construction of the Eldoret Bypass, but so far only a handful of residents have received part of the money. The government says it is still in the process of verifying the larger numbers in the compensation list. I list to the residents say they suspect foul play, accusing the government of using delaying tactics so that they give up the chase for the compensation. Now, they note that come June 30th, they will stop the construction until they are fully paid. The commission is 
On its part, NLT says the due process must be followed in the compensation matter while accusing some of the residents of failing to meet the necessary requirements for compensation. Already, the Treasury has released 300 million shillings to Kenha for the payments. Lakini kifikia stage ya payment, kuna document lazima ziletwe ili ile payment ikue released. The Eldoret Bypass will start at Chaplas Key Centre and traverse through Kapsaret Centre on the Eldoret Kisumu Road before terminating at Leseru in Mailitisa along the Eldoret Malaba Highway. Lois Wangoe, NTV Business, Eldoret. The Government Task Force report on the sugar industry due for presentation to President Uhuru Kenyatta next week could be rejected by farmers after the sole representative of farmers in the task force, Francis Waswa, disowned the draft document accusing his counterparts of manipulating it. He accuses the task force members of sidelining him and totally disregarding the wishes of the farmers in drafting of the document. In the public participation meetings have hardly been taken into account and therefore it is a raw deal for the farmers and I say no I would not be party to the team I will not be party to the to the report if the farmers consider if the farmers terms are not taken into account among among the the, the problems the farmers were brought forward was the crops act 2013 and the AFA act 2013 have failed and the, industry, the sugar industry is on its knees, completely on its knees. Meanwhile, the private sector has welcomed recent amendments to the 2008 Anti-Counterfeit Act as they have made it easier to deal with the counterfeiters. The Act will seek to not only fight illicit trade but also promote genuine manufacturers. The amendments aim to provide more protection for trademark owners and boost the fight against counterfeits. Some of the amendments in the Act include the fact that consumers will now play a pivotal role in promoting the fight against counterfeit products as the end users of the product. The Act will also give an inspector the power to investigate any offence relating to counterfeit even when the same is not an offence under the Act. Kenya is set to host the first ever United Nations Human Settlements Program Assembly from 27th to 31st of May 2019 at the United Nations offices in Gigiri. The meeting will focus on innovation and bettering the quality of life in cities. This event is happening at a time the world is experiencing rapid urbanization, which has resulted in shortage of affordable and decent housing. You know, as you know, we have this um, unfactoring uh, distinction of having the biggest slums in Africa. You know, we want to get rid of it. And others which are coming up, Kibera, Madale, Marigoine and so forth, we want to get rid of these informal settlements. And that's why we are happy when we get uh, partners like the World Bank coming forward to support us through these uh, kind of programs. With 47 minutes past the hour, we end business news now, but we'll be continuing with more after the break.
retired Colonel Cyrus Oguna took office officially today with the promise to revamp its operations and improve government communication. Oguna, who had earlier served as a spokesperson for the military, now faces a full in-trade that includes the daunting task of improving the image of the office, battered by poor coordination, a shortage of staff and inadequate funding. NTV's Silas Apollo reports. Retired Colonel Cyrus Oguna today made his maiden address as government spokesman. Good morning, everyone. Laying out his plans for the new office. Communication philosophy in this office will we'll, we'll focus on dialogue as opposed to monologue. It will therefore be my wish that we work together with the citizens and share in their expectations and aspirations in life. I believe I'm handing over the job of being the voice of the government of Kenya to probably one of the most competent Kenyans who could do the job. Oguna, a former military spokesperson who became the face of Operation Linda Inchi in Somalia, promised to improve the vibrancy and work of the office. But Oguna takes up new duties in an office whose relevance has been on the wane. Some of its previous holders have been accused of either being ineffective or playing to the public gallery and spinning propaganda for the government. This at least is according to an exit report authored by Kiraithi, who says that the government spokesperson has been turned into a spectator as CSS and heads of parastatals blow their own trumpets to the media. Kiraithi blames this on the lack of coordination between ministries and government agencies and a centralized system of communication. Take this case for instance. CBC national pilot be extended for one more year. The national rollout will take place in January 2020. That is former education CS Amina Mohammed making an about turn on a previous statement on the implementation of the new competency-based curriculum. And her defense a few days later was this. I think in the end, um, it's only a dead man that does not change their mind or woman for that matter. I think for as long as we are alive, we change our minds 10 times a day on issues that are some important, some less important. Oguna, who admitted to the challenges, says he's ready for the task and that he intends to make the office more effective and visible. I intend to maintain an open door policy for greater interaction and engagement with you and the public. My plan is to have a press conference every Thursday. This is the first one this Thursday. The office of the government spokesperson was established in 2004 and has had two holders, including current Machakos governor Alfred Mutua. Sailors Apollo, NTV. Maybe we can allow our... All the best to Colonel retired Cyrus Oguna. Elsewhere, NTV today awarded the sixth group of winners of the Watch and Win promotion. The six winners walked away with gifts that included vouchers and a television. The lucky winners only needed to answer questions that appear on NTV during the day. And the grand draw will be held on the 31st of May, where the winner will win a four-day trip to Dubai. The question that I answered was which show always airs on NTV at 10 p.m. And it's the trend. Uh, the competition is so real. And I'll continue playing more and more until I win the grand prize. <laughs> Now, on September the 21st, 1983, retired President Daniel Arab Moy forcefully took over a 53-acre piece of land owned by ex-chief Noah Kibngeni Chalugui through a scheme that involved ordering lands officials to make the necessary transfers to register the property and then, 24 years later, sold it to a firm owned by the Jaswant Rai family. Well, then all went quiet until last week when the High Court in Eldoret ruled that the former president's move was illegal and ordered both Mr. Moy and Rye Plywood Limited to pay Mr. Chalugoy's family one billion shillings, which is the current market value of the prime property. We'll get a copy of the Daily Nation tomorrow for details of how the country's, or rather how more of the country's daring land grabs were planned right from within State House.
Next up on NTV, it's the Sports News with Brian Otwell. Don't go far. The Kenya Academy of Sports Council through the chairperson Dr. Paul Terry. Time on NTV Sport. Welcome, my name is Brian Otwal. Olympic 800 meters bronze medalist Margaret Nyairera Wamboi says she feels rejected, noting that the IAAF ruling this month that requires women with high levels of testosterone to take medication to suppress it is cruel on the sport. Wamboi returned, uh, returned from a disappointing sixth place finish in the 800 meters at the Doha Diamond League and was meant to leave for the IAAF World Ch Challenge Athletics meeting in Nanjing next week. But now her future is one with big question mark. The IAAF decision that women with elevated testosterone levels will have to take suppressive treatment to keep it below 5 nanomoles per litre if they wish to compete as females in certain events has had Casta Semenya's rival in 800 meters, Kenya's Margaret Wamboi Nyairera. <laughs> Nyairera, who is Olympic 800 meters bronze medal winner, has herself faced questions over her testosterone levels and has slammed the IAAF ruling against her rival Semenya. For me, I'm not going to take medication because I'm not sick and uh, 
even if uh, to tell us now to take medication, th those are those are chemicals that you are putting on your body, you, of which you don't know at the end of it what will come to affect you later. Nyerere haplessly plays second fiddle to her two rivals, Olympic and World 800 meters champion Semenya and Burundian Francine Saba, but unlike Semenya, has not been forced to undergo tests for hyperandrogenism. The 24-year-old took the world by storm five years ago when she won the World Junior Championships 800 meters title in a personal best time of 2 minutes 0 0.49 seconds, establishing herself as one of the world's top two lap runners since. But now feels her career will end due to the rules. I'm worried now. I'm, I'm, I'm already worried about my career because I just know that since I was a, a small kid, I, I just grew, grew up knowing that this is my career now. So for now, I feel so disappointed by, by that ruling. For about a decade, Semenya has been the symbol of furious debate worldwide about questions of gender, women with elevated testosterone and physical advantage. However, her testosterone levels are not publicly known. And with the rules already being affected in races over distances of 400 meters to the mile, they are... In men category, you, you are likely maybe to perform well and we celebrate that, we celebrate that. But when it comes to women, we have to, we have to tell them to lower it and we, we draw them out of competition. Why? Why? Last week, Athletics Kenya had to drop 100 meters and 200 meters champion Maximila Imali and 400 meters runner Evangeline Makena from the team for the IAAF World Relays event in Japan over their high levels of testosterone. We are just natural. We, d we did not drop. We are ju just natural. One boy has ruled out the thought of switching to another distance like 5,000 meters as it will take years to reach elite levels with different skills and training needed. Moving on, Bandari dislodged Sofapaka from second position in the Kenyan Premier League standings following a 3-1 victory over visiting Tasca in the match played at the Mbaraki Sports Club in Mombasa. Tasca took the lead through Eugene Asike, but goals from veteran Shaban Kenga, Yema Mwana and substitute Benjamin Mosha ensured the maximum points for the Doxmen that takes their tally to 58 points, 8 behind leaders Gonmahia. The loss was the 8th for the Brewers who remain in 7th place on 46 points, 20 behind leaders Gonmahia. Mashemeji Derby headlines this weekend's action as the league enters match day 31 with AFC Leopards hosting Gonmahia at the Kasarani Stadium on Sunday. And the National Sevens Rugby team coach Paul Murunga has made three changes to his squad for the London and Paris legs of the World Sevens Rugby Series. Cyprian Kuto, Brian Wandera and Charles Omondi return to the team after recovering from injuries. Murunga has retained the rest of his regulars. Vincent Tonyala, Andrew Amonde, Bush Mwale, Daniel Sikuta, Eden Aguero, Daniel Tabu, Jeffrey Olwoch, Nelson Oyo and Johnston Olindi. Captain Jacob Oje is back after missing the Asian tour due to academic commitments and will be de deputized by All Watch. The London 7th will be held on 25th and 26th of May, while the Paris 7th is set for 1st and 2nd of June. Head coach Jafet Munala stuck with a final list of experienced players as he named the team that will take part in the All-Africa Games qualifiers in Kampala, Uganda. Veteran setters Jen Washu and Janet Wanja retained their positions in the strong-looking squad that will be captained by Kenya Prisons left attacker Masi Moim. Head coach Jafet Munala, who will be assisted by Italian coach Shailene Ramdu and Jost Barraza in the qualifiers, also included Africa Club Championship best attacker Sharon Chepchumba in his final squad of 12 players. The trio of Kenya Prisons edit Wisa KCB's Lauren Chebet, pipeline captain Triza Tuka are the team's middle blockers, while Agrippina Kundu is the the sole libero player in the squad. Kenya, who are the all Africa Games defending champions, will line up against hosts Uganda, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Tanzania and Egypt. The team departs for Uganda on Saturday.
and 152 professionals and four amateurs will compete in the 2019 KCB Current Masters at the Current Country Club from the 26th to 30th June. The event is a fully sanctioned Sunshine Tour event and will have 15 million Kenya shillings in prize money. 100 professionals will fly in for the tournament to join 47 locals and regional golf professionals. Kenya will feature 27 professionals of which 21 will be selected from the ongoing KCB Road to Current Masters Golf Series. And the Milwaukee Bucks are striking fast in the Eastern Conference Finals. Brooke Lopez posted 29 points and 11 rebounds as the Bucks beat the Toronto Raptors 108 to 100 in Game One in Milwaukee last night. The Bucks trailed by 13 early but came storming back with a big fourth quarter. The Bucks outscored Toronto 32-17 in the final quarter of the game to pull away. And Giannis Antetoko Unpo added 24 points and 14 boards for the Bucks, and who take a 1-0 lead in the best of seven set. Kawhi Leonard scored 31 points and Kyle Lowry added 30 for the Raptors, who led by as many as 13 early and took an 83-76 lead into the final quarter. The Bucks host two on Friday. Masai, thank you for watching. Thanks to Rafael Mbalo, our sign language interpreter, and thanks very much to you. We'll see you again next week. I'm Smriti Bidiathi. Bye bye.